No other warships in the world can match their scale or firepower. We're joining one of America's Nimitz-class aircraft carriers, 47,000 tonnes of steel and home to four squadrons of US Navy fighter jets. Named in honour of the 41st President, the George H.W. Bush arrived in the Arabian Gulf in late March, her crowded deck operating around the clock, delivering America's assault on the terrorists of Islamic State. Uh, the pace that we're at and the number of sorties that we get into our it varies a little bit, but essentially we start uh, and uh, we end up with about a 13-hour fly day, and the number of sorties uh, that we generate is in the, oh, about 20 uh, direct OIR supports a day, uh, in uh, some about five hours long, others seven hours long. And, and that's been pretty consistent uh, throughout, uh, throughout our time here. And that's a nice, comfortable pace for us. Uh, we're able to suspend that. Uh, we could surge uh, to a greater number of sorties or a longer fly day, but, it's, but at some point, uh, then we would have to uh, take a pause. But uh, at the pace we're at right now, we could go on uh, essentially indefinitely. The Bush is the 10th and final Nimitz-class carrier to be built Delivered in 2009, she's constructed from more than one billion separate parts. With a top speed of 30 knots, CVN 77 is more than a thousand feet long, about the size of the Empire State Building. On board live 5,000 sailors and 80 combat aircraft. The carrier has enough supplies to survive at sea for 90 days, and her nuclear reactors can operate for more than two decades without refueling. Bush's firepower comes from her squadrons of FA-18s. Around 50 operate from the carrier day and night, a mix of Hornets and the more modern FA-18 Super Hornet. Below in the ship's vast hangar, hundreds of engineers maintain the aircraft and keep them mission ready. This is the second time the George H.W. Bush has deployed here to the Gulf. Back in 2014, this was the first American warship to launch airstrikes against Islamic State. For the pilots who fly these jets, it's an intense seven months of combat. And whereas two years ago they were hitting IS targets right across Iraq, many of them out in the open, in recent months they've been focusing their efforts on helping Iraqi troops as they fight their way through the densely packed streets of Mosul. In their briefing room just below the flight deck, these are some of the pilots conducting those combat sorties. On average, they'll each fly several missions a week over Iraq and Syria, a mix of deliberate strike operations hitting known ISIS targets or dynamic sorties providing rapid airstrikes in support of Iraqi, Kurdish or Syrian Democratic forces. This pilot's known by his call sign, Butters. Age 35, he's been flying jets for 11 years. This, his fourth combat deployment. And you've flown missions over Mosul? I have, yes. And, and Raqqa as well? Yes, I've been over both. And, and what is that like, just knowing what's below you? Um, it's, uh, it's something we uh, brief to on every flight, knowing exactly which folks we're going to be working with. Uh, it brings you back down to earth knowing that uh, you know, we're talking with folks who are on the ground. We, we come overhead for a few hours at a time and support them as best we can. And these are folks who aren't, uh, they are there um, fighting the, the fight before we get there and after we leave. So uh, that kind of grounds you in terms of uh, perspective on what's really going on. And I've been involved with multiple instances of, of close air support in close proximity to friendly troops um, where they are, uh, are facing stiff resistance or, um, or other uh, aspects that are impeding their ability to, to move forward or, or accomplish what they're trying to do that day. So. Uh, we've been called in um, in several different instances where we're either um, looking at uh, degrading the enemy's ability to, to move freely in a specific area um, and then also specifically targeting uh, mortar positions, things that uh, are directly affecting the, uh, the ability of the ground troops to, to move forward. Bush's deployment is expected to last seven months, and of course it's coincided with the arrival of a new US president. 
Has the change in administration changed anything that you do? Yeah, there really isn't. You know, we left uh, the day after uh, the swearing in uh, at the White House. So we had trained for over a year for this primary mission. We knew we were coming into an urban environment. We knew that uh, we knew who our coalition partners uh, uh, were at the time. Uh, so our strikes, as I compare them to the Eisenhower and the Harry S. Truman, who were here before we were, our strikes have stayed relatively the same. Uh, they've stayed exactly the same when it comes to the target. The target is the ISIS uh, fighters. What we've seen is, is they've, as ISIS has moved into those three enclaves that I've talked about, is our areas that we're going to uh, have reduced. We've, we've stayed in, in certain areas because of, that's where the ISIS fighters are. For these US Navy air crew, there are plenty more combat sorties to come as the coalition continues its mission to destroy Islamic State. Right around three miles is when we're going to start our descent uh, from altitude to intercept a, a good uh, glide path to then land. I would say there's more talking at night. In the daytime, uh, we do things a lot more visually, and we're actually trained to do it without talking at all. So we can uh, sequence all our aircraft on deck without saying a word. Uh, and, but at nighttime, it requires a little more uh, discussion to make sure we know exactly where everybody is. It's nearly midnight, and on the deck of the George H.W. Bush, the jets return. This giant warship is home to four fighter squadrons. For the aircrew comes not just the danger of combat over Iraq and Syria, but also the extreme risks of flying from a carrier. The beginning and the end are definitely the most intense. Uh, I would say the, uh, the takeoff is uh, intense in a fun way. Um, it's something most pilots enjoy. And then uh, the landing is probably the most challenging, especially after a long mission. Uh, so it's something that we're very well trained for, um, but there are always uh, added aspects of difficulty, whether it's at night, what the winds are doing specifically, so uh, that increases the level of challenge at the end of a flight. Uh, kind of one of the unique features of an F-18, or really any carrier aircraft, is the fact that the landing gear are extremely stout. As you can see here, this kind of looks uh, like what you'd see on an off-road racing vehicle. This pilot has also flown many missions over Iraq and Syria, at the controls of an F-A-18 Super Hornet. I think kind of one of the cool things if you look at is, you know, just the pure size of this aircraft. It's uh, obviously when you're sitting in it and you're flying it, you kind of feel like you're on the front of a rocket ship, which is kind of cool. You're uh, strapped into an ejection seat and then you got about uh, 50, 60 feet of aircraft behind you with those engines. Obviously, uh, a lot of your focus is forward, but every now and then you look in your mirrors and you realize it's a lot. The F-A-18 is now the US Navy's primary strike fighter and has been used to launch thousands of airstrikes on ISIS. Known as the Rhino, the Super Hornet is an upgrade on its smaller forebear. With the retirement of the F-14 Tomcat, 25 US Navy squadrons now fly some variant of this jet. Each of these aircraft costs around $98 million and is capable of Mach 1.8, just shy of 1,400 miles per hour. Bring it up. Since the start of operation in Herat Resolve, the US has carried out more than 16,000 airstrikes. Last December, Pentagon officials claimed 50,000 ISIS fighters had been killed. This is very much the business end of the coalition's war on the so-called Islamic State. These ordnance handlers in red are loading weapons, including these 500-pound JDAM bombs, onto these F-18 jets ready for airstrikes on ISIS. This is the most technologically advanced air war ever conducted, but when the battlefield is a city like Mosul, the stakes are raised. The risk to civilian life, a key concern for commanders. So anytime you move from a rural environment where the collateral damage uh, is not as difficult to solve and you move into an urban environment where uh, you have, to, you have to deliver weapons uh, knowing what collateral damage uh, uh, you potentially are going to cause, how to fuse that weapon to reduce the collateral damage, how to make sure that you've had an unblinking eye over top of that target so that you can see the pattern of light and differentiate between who the enemy forces are and who the civilian forces are. It becomes very difficult. The pace, the strikes remain the same. It's still a weapon coming off of the aircraft. 
The difference is it's now the amount, the speed at which you do it. Now you, you spend a, a lot more time determining that the target that you're going after is truly an enemy combatant. The bush is built from 700,000 separate pieces of metal and in the ship's engineering workshop, they can make almost any spare part they need. Down in the machine shop, the MRs, we turn and burn. Uh, we take stock metal uh, that's shipped to us and we can turn it into anything the ship needs. So the wear and tear of operating in this um, area of the world, along with the salt water and the corrosion and the humidity, it'll uh, mess a lot of parts up. So it'll kind of accelerate that decomposition of the parts. So when things need to get replaced immediately for a mission op, rather than flying it all the way from the States, we can make it right here on the spot. It would take us a couple days rather than three weeks. One of the oldest rates in the US Navy is Bosun's mate. Known as boats, these men and women keep this giant carrier operating day to day. What we do is we handle the general upkeep of the ship, the preservation of it. We also bring on supplies and fuel for the jets. Um, one of the things that we do is we handle the anchor chain. That's one of the main focuses of our job. Which is enormous. Yes, it weighs 60,000 pounds and it is 12 fathoms long. The Bush was the first US carrier to launch airstrikes on ISIS back in 2014. For America, this three-year air war hasn't come cheap. Between 2014 and December last year, the US government spent nearly $2.5 billion on weapons. Daily flying operations cost a further $4.5 billion. The total cost to the US taxpayer just under $11 billion. Below deck stands a huge bronze statue of this ship's famous namesake. Long before he was president, George H.W. Bush was a naval aviator, the youngest US pilot of the Second World War. The carrier that proudly bears his name is at the forefront of another battle, operating day and night, seven days a week. At the head of an air campaign, it's hoped, will hasten the end of ISIS.